Not expected, so if the alarm sounds, please evacuate the building quickly and calmly. Please use the stairs and do not use the lift. On one side of the building, please gather outside the radio money building on the opposite side of the road. Exit by the door by which you entered the room or by the fire exit, which are clearly identified. If you need any assistance in evacuating the building, please make yourself known to a member of staff. Please also make sure all your mobile phones are turned off or set to silent. And I'm advising that the meeting, if all or part of the meeting, will be recorded for future broadcast. Move on to item two, apologies, any member. Move on to the minutes to confirm the minutes of the meeting held on the 27th of July. You're happy for me to sign them as a true record. Okay. Agreed? to item four declarations of interest receive declarations of disposal pecuniary and other interests in accordance with the members code of carnival there's only declarations that aren't on the paperwork councillor walmsley uh, thank you chair obviously as a substitute to the meeting my declarations aren't printed in the agenda however they are available on the council's website for all to see thank you councillor Candival. Thank you, Chair. On item two, I suggested when the application was made that they improve the cycle racks, which the applicant has done. I don't think this is a prejudicial interest, as I didn't, it wasn't about determining the application, but just actually taking on board the uh, need for proper cycle racks. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Gosteridge. Thank you, Chair. I was contacted by the residents along the Lutterworth Road on the left-hand side, asking about development. I pointed her in the direction of the uh, Attleborough councillors at the time, June Tandy and Andrew Sargent. Thank you. Any other member? No. You want to directions of contact? Any member? No. Uh, applications for planning permission on which the public have indicated a desire to speak. I have got speakers on every item except five, so we'll go in the order they are. If, if I just talk you through the procedure in terms of public speaking, so you're allowed three minutes. I will be quite strict on that to say anything. The members, after you've had your three minutes, can ask any points of clarification from you. And the, if there's anything that the members have raised, they'll raise it with the officer. Okay? I'll do with that. Thank you. Move on to item one then, Jeffrey. That's all right. right. This application is to convert the existing hip roof of the detached garage in the rear garden to a gabled roof to include a new enclosed external staircase to the southern elevation and a dormer roof window above the existing garage doors. The overall height of the garage will remain the same at 5.1 metres. The intention is that the resulting additional roof space will be used as a home gym. The slide photograph shows the garage as existing with roof lights and solar panels and the plans show the proposed alterations to the garage. The application was deferred by members at the last committee in order to allow the planning department to take measurements on site, particularly in relation to the distance from the garage to number 155, uh, from, from the garage to number 155 Lutterworth Road. A site visit was also requested by members to assess site levels and to assess the impact on overlooking to number 155 Lutterworth Road. This was duly carried out this afternoon uh, by members this afternoon. Members also requested details of the original conditions for the replacement dwelling, application reference 032927, to be added to the agenda. You'll find these on pages 18 to 19 of the agenda. 
The application has been reported to committee at the request of Councillor Sargent and Councillor Baxter Payne and former Councillor Tandy. There have been two objections from two addresses to the original plans and two objections from two addresses to the amended plans. These are proceed on the agenda, pages 19 and 20. These objections include the concerns that the garage could become a dwelling, concerns on loss of privacy and querying whether the floor would need to be strengthened for a gym. But this latter objection is not a planning consideration. In terms of visual amenity, the garage is to the rear of the property and therefore not visible from Lutterworth Road. This being the case, the building will not detract, detract from the character of the area, appear intrusive or dominate the existing property. The visual amenity to the public realm is therefore considered acceptable. In relation to residential amenity, the blue, bar, block, the blue box on the plan, sorry, shown is uh, the footprint of the existing garage. The red box is the staircase, the location of the new enclosed staircase. The photograph on the top right hand side is taken from the applicant's patio across to number 151. The aerial photograph in the middle of the slide shows the applicant's property with their rear raised patio in white, that area there, and the outline of the garage, the application relates to just to the south of it. 151 Lutterworth Road, that neighbour, is uh, detached to the west and has a single storey rear extension which is not protected. The rear wall and roof of the garage are adjacent to part of the side of this property's rear garden. There is a separation distance between the northern elevation of the garage and the rear extension of number 151 of approximately 11.7 metres. Hopefully I've, I've made those, all those measurements clear on the plan. The approximate position of this neighbour's rear extension is shown as a rectangle on the back of the original house and there are no direct views onto the garage from any of number 151's windows. The proposed rear elevation is shown on the right hand side of the screen and is the elevation that will be seen from 151. The patterned areas are the areas of proposed new roof and wall. In other words, there and there. The white, the clear, is the existing structure. There are no windows proposed on this elevation, as you can see, and the proposed new staircase is enclosed. That's where the new staircase will look like from that neighbour. So it will not lead to overlooking to this property. Therefore, despite the fact the building will partly be seen above the fence line, it is considered that the changes will not result in an oppressive or overbearing sense of enclosure to either the house or garden of number 151. The dormer roof windows are on the roof plane that faces towards 155 Littleworth Road, meaning the new dormer windows okay. will face the rear garden of number 155, which is a detached bungalow with dormers to the roof. That's 155 there. A photograph to show the neighbouring property taken from the applicant's raised patio is shown on the bottom right hand side of the screen. That's, that's from the applicant's property. There is a minimum distance between the closest original corner of 155 to the closest corner of the garage as 21 metres. There's approximately 16.8 metres to the corner of the conservatory, which is the small rectangle you can see there. As a result of this and the relationship between the two buildings, officers consider there will be no significant impact on original ground floor windows to habitable rooms. Obviously due to the difficult for officers and members being able to enter properties at the moment, the neighbour has taken photos from the windows within their property towards the existing structure and are shown on the slide. In terms of overlooking to the garden of 155, the separation distance between the new proposed dormer windows and the boundary has been measured by the case officer and is 7.87 metres at the northern corner, increasing to 8.33 metres at the southern corner. Those are the two measurements you can see there. These distances comply with the minimum distance of 7 metres in the Council's Sustainable Design and Construction SPD for first floor windows overlooking um, neighbouring residential properties. 
It is considered that the proposal is compliance with the Council's Sustainable Design and Construction SBD in terms of visual amenity and residential amenity to neighbouring properties. And the recommendation is approval subject to conditions that the materials used are in keeping with the existing building and that the garage is not used other than incidental to the enjoyment of the existing dwelling house. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jackie. Move on to the speakers then. So, Mr. Andrew Woods. Um. Hopefully now you've all had the opportunity to visit our property and stand on the patio in front of the windows. I'm sorry the patio is a little wobbly in places. It's the next job on the agenda. But I'm sure you can appreciate that our privacy will be severely restricted. It is for this reason we are objecting to the proposed plan to have the windows and stairs directly facing our property. These plans have caused us to suffer from immense stress and sleepless nights during this, this horrible time. We cannot understand why neighbor, our neighbours would want the opportunity to view into our property as this would infringe on their privacy too. All we ask is that you vote as if you were in our shoes and the property was yours. I'm sure after viewing the property you will all agree on the reasons for objecting against these proposed plans. It isn't fair that people spend huge amounts of money on their dream homes only for the planning permission to be curbed by one of the main reasons that we have the, bought, the, bought the property for the privacy in our garden and home. It was and it is a major factor in our decision to purchase and enjoy the house. I appreciate the measurement you have taken maybe just outside the guidelines. However, as the word states, guidelines, surely this is down to individual cases, especially when the privacy is severely affected, such as this case. Our windows are very large, unlike the majority of small modern houses, and can easily be seen into. This property needs the large windows to allow the light into the property. Finally, please can I all ask you to, again to vote compassionately as if you own the, and purchase the property for the benefits and the location and not being overlooked. I appreciate the law makes it difficult to turn down plans easily, but we did agree to the compromise of the plans in the last meeting. Please, if it must go ahead, just remove the windows and stairs from the side elevation facing directly towards our windows and patio and reposition the windows and stairs to face 153's rear garden. This will preserve everyone's privacy and all parties will benefit. Thank you for listening. Any member got any points of clarification? No, thank you. I'd just like to thank you all for taking the time to complete a site visit and also for listening to us today. We would still like to express our objection to the proposal as it stands. We objected to the garage being built in the garden in 2014 and brought our objections to the planning committee. At that time, committee members were split about the decision with one member stating that they did not like the idea of garages in gardens or would not like it to become a common occurrence in Littleworth Road. Would this proposal not set that precedent that has already been regarded as detrimental to the area? It was also partly due to this opinion that it was agreed the proposal could go ahead as long as the garage wasn't used as a habitable space. It is therefore difficult for us to comprehend why now this is being discussed as an option. Although we were disappointed at the time when it was agreed that the proposal could go ahead, we truly believed that would be it and there would, no be, uh, there would not be any additional proposal or add-ons which would further impact even more on our property. It is with this in mind that I would like to ask you all to consider when buying our house in 2000, we bought it for the space inside and out and the natural fauna and flora within the garden space. So our view was always of that. We never expected that this could be changed so radically and for us to look onto what can only be described as an eyesore. We thought the current garage was bad enough but as I have said, we accepted it in 2014 and the coming years. However, with even further changes being considered, I would like to ask the question about the rights we have. It was said in the last meeting that neighbours don't have a right to privacy, yet surely we have a right to the view we bought when we purchased our property in 2000. I can only compare it to ordering a red car from a car sales room, but when you go to the showroom to pick it up, they expect you to accept a blue car with no explanation or understanding why this might not be acceptable. Well, we all know that this wouldn't be acceptable. So I'd question the reasoning of allowing a blemish to our view from every back room in our house, 
as well as garden and patio, especially as when we bought the property, it was for the whole house and view. Bearing in mind the very important point that this has been the most expensive purchase we will or will ever have made. The proposals will fundamentally change the view from our house as well as impact on our privacy in an unacceptable way. I implore you to consider what this could further mean to us. As well as the further damage, such a precedent allows for a neighbourhood as a whole, especially when there could be an alternative of placing the windows to face the garden of the applicant and not our property. Once again, we really thank you for listening and coming to see it today. Thank you. Any member got any points of clarification? Councillor Condicle. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, you talked about the view. When we did the site visit, there was a bit of screening above the fence. I'm not sure if the fence is yours or your neighbours, and, and if you could just clarify about the screening, it would be useful. Yeah. And side, and when the house, sorry, initially when we had the house, um, there was hedgerow all down the right hand side as it is on the left hand side. And when the, the new building took place, that was all knocked down and it was overgrown and it was bulldozed down really. It was damaged that we, you know, it needed repairing. And therefore, the neighbours put the fence up. But as you can see, the top piece, it, when you stand on their patio, you, you know, it's that high up that you can see from you know, well below your head. So I had that made and I, I'll pull that on myself. Thank you. Any other members? No. Thank you. Jackie, anything you need to come back on? There's nothing actually to come back on, but one of the members actually requested that we did a uh, measurement uh, from the back of the applicant's house to the, to the fence. Uh, we measured it and it was 2.54 metres. Normally a car parking space at this moment is time is 2.5 metres. Thank you, Jack. Thank you for that, Jackie. Right, to enable debate, can I have a member to move the recommendations and a seconder, please? Any member? Thank you, Councillor Smith. I'll move it to the loud debate. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Seconder? Mr. Wilson, thank you. Moving into base, any member? Councillor Evans. Uh, thank you, Chair. Could I ask a question, if possible, to uh, an officer? Um, is this classed as a, a backland development? No, we wouldn't class it as a backland development. Backland development would mean if it was houses being proposed for the site, uh, but an, an ancillary building to the uh, to, to the actual house, we wouldn't consider it as backland. Thank you. Thank you. Come back again, Councillor Evans. Yes. So if they were to submit, uh, if, if we hypothetically granted approval and they then submitted a change of use, application from ancillary to residential would the council then deem that to be backland development if an application they could use it um, as an ancillary annex as it stands once the alterations were done because you can amend a garage for your ancillary use it doesn't matter what the use is as long as it's for your own use um, that would be once the actual alterations were done, because basically the legislation is that you, if you build a residential annex, um, you require consent. But if you convert an existing building, it doesn't re require consent, but it would always have to be ancillary. I think the question is you're saying about changing it to an actual standalone house with its own uh, amenities, um, et cetera, uh, toilet, kitchen, et cetera. Um, we would obviously then have to consider it if, if that was proposed it would require a change of use and we would then have to consider it as a backland development okay, uh, one more i promise um so I, I suspect i know the answer to this question but i presume officers haven't looked at our own guidance on backland developments and considered whether this application would be granted approval if it was classed as a backland 
development. Yeah, we're not considering it as a house, a standalone house at the moment, so we're not considering it as backland development. What we're considering that's before you at the moment is alterations to uh, a building that is used by the actual house. So everybody has, well, most people have sheds, garages, things in, in back gardens. We don't consider those as backland development. The, the term backland development comes in when you're looking at actual residential standalone houses. Any other member? I apologise. Let me look. <laughs> Councillor Markham, apologies. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is, if this was um, actually granted, are we able to put any condition on that the windows are actually obscured um, so they're not clear, so they're not see-through, so therefore they don't actually, they can't see out over to 155 um, with that and the openings, please. As it's a gym, I see no reason why we couldn't condition it to be obscure glazed. Uh, in terms of openable lights, they would probably need some form of ventilation in there, so that would probably be against uh, building regulations. Uh, but we could certainly condition it that any windows within there were top light openings that were, say, 1.7 metres above the, the finished floor level of the rooms they serve. That what, that's what we would normally do uh, where we had concerns about overlooking. Okay. Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's a difficult predicament because if we look at it in terms of planning legislation, I don't see how we could refuse it, if I'm honest. If we did, I think we would be at risk of it going to appeal and we would, given the evidence that we've had from officers and their professional opinion, I don't think this is one where it is a matter of degree and scale or... or or a tight decision. I think the, the planning terms are quite clear, so I think we would be found to be unreasonable and have significant costs awarded against us on this, unfortunately. Um, there is no such thing as a right to a view. Um, many people over the years could claim that, and many people over the years have had a house, they've bought it for the view, then they've found a house which has been built behind them. Where I live at the moment, um, I'm quite often told where I used to be, there used to be a stream at the bottom and, and um, garden and fields as far as the eye can see, up to where Councillor Gutteridge is, I, I believe. Um, uh, so, I don't, that, and I, as I understand it, there's case law as rule, there is no such thing as a right to a view. Um, so that ties our hands. But I do think Councillor Markham's suggestion is a viable way to try and resolve the impasse if the main concern is about um, privacy um, I, I disagree about the issue with the stairs that's enclosed um, so I don't see that being a particular issue we could hang our hat on but I think as a suitable compromise and the, and the committee trying to be as creative as it possibly can to resolve the issue I would be prepared to move as an amendment chair that we go along with the um, suggestion from Councillor Markham that we um, condition um, obscure glass and that the ventilation is at the top of the window. If that is something that officers believe is defendable and will go, I know it won't completely please the objectors in this case, but I think it will be the best that the committee can do, then I'm willing to propose that and hope that someone will second it. Because I don't think we're if we refuse it outright, I think we would be on a very sticky wicket chair. Got a seconder, Councillor Walmsley. Okay. I'm, I'm looking at yourself, Jackie, and, and do you're happy with the amendment going. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's always a chance that it could be appealed. The people can con uh, appeal conditions and the inspector might consider that because it actually meets the seven metres in our own SBD that uh, it's unacceptable, but that would 
that would be a, a, a risk we would take. But I see no reason because it's a natural gym that we could um, that we couldn't condition it. I'm not seeing Wendy jump up and down, so. And you're happy with that, Wendy? Yeah. Mm, okay. Okay. So if we're happy to add the the amendment, and members happy for that, Councillor Warren, do you wish to speak? Oh, right, so, so if, if I can move this bit then, if we're happy for that amendment to be added in, if we grant planning permission, members, yeah, consensus, and Councillor Walmsley. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to check something with the officer, and I have to say, I wish I'd spotted this before the visit, I did it myself. Um, pages 18 to 19, we talk about the relevant planning history, and there's been a number of appeals up until the end of 2019, um, regards a drop curb and the previous consent which was obviously detailed at the top of page 19 that the um, removing the existing vehicular access was that done and carried out do we know Um, I would have to actually go out and have a look. Um, I mean, that is an unrelated to this actual application, so it would be something that would go. We'd have to go down the enforcement route um, uh, separately, and then we'd have to consider how long that's actually been in, in place as well. Is that not something we could add as condition as part of this development, though, if it hadn't been done? and recondition it effectively because I, I don't think that's an unreasonable I think it probably would be I would tend to say that would be an unreasonable condition because what we're actually looking at is the structure there's no amendments to uh, access at all um, there's no new garage or anything there's no increase as far as we can tell with this ancillary structure of um, vehicular access or vehicular cars to the property so I just don't think it would be reasonable Thank you Chair uh, Yeah thank you Chair if that could perhaps be passed to the enforcement we can have that checked that would be I think quite appropriate um, and it's certainly something that's flagged up on this application so if that could be passed across for for just double checking that that would be very welcome uh, so uh, and some of the vision of the um, the officer at the moment um, in respect of that so just thank you for clarifying that thank you chair thank you councillor gosridge thank you chair um, the officer said an ancillary building uh looking in years to come what happens if they don't want a gymnasium can we put a condition that it is just a gymnasium or a games room or what because I'm mindful that we all get fed up of going to the gym, as I have. Um, but I am worried for the neighbours because it is a carbuncle in my eyes overlooking onto their their garden. I think the windows ought to be on the other side and uh, opaque or, you know, frosted out. But I'm mindful that y you said it was an ancillary building. You know, what's to stop them putting a settee and stuff in one of the garages and making the garage as a room, which you said people have done, and then making the upstairs to something totally different to a gym? Is there any conditions that we can put in there that it is just a gymnasium? My feelings is no i don't think that would be a reasonable condition i think as far as we could go would be it would be ancillary to uh, the use because you can change without requiring uh, planning uh, existing outbuildings to um, ancillary family alexes can i come back I'm very worried now when you say ancillary because that opens up a multitude of things. Uh, what is to stop them putting a sofa bed up there and a TV? What, you know, I am worried that, you know, eventually, and probably I'm a bit 
street wise as they might say for a old boy what's to stop them making it into a living accommodation yeah as i say that there would be nothing in planning le legislation because it would be still be ancillary as long as it was used for family members there's a lot of legislation on family annexes as you, as you can probably appreciate basically a family annex is that some of the um the servicing is shared with the house in other words they share the kitchen or they share um bathroom facilities things like that um but just actually making it as a gym as i say i just don't think we could so yeah there is always that case as i say the case law is in terms of detached buildings in people's gardens they can become family annexes if it was then rented out to people outside the family then that wouldn't be ancillary um, and we could obviously look into that but if it was used by family members um, and it wasn't used as a entity in its own right with all its own services um, then as I say we I don't think we could thank you chair um another point and forgive me if I'm reading these plans wrong but I recall previously we had um, a development on a car park site that I sat on whereby similar to this the windows were set back slightly from the edge of the property and one of the things we were able to condition there was that the door the windows couldn't be converted into doors or Juliet balcony or for actually for a balcony to be able to be used from the roof in front of it is that something that could apply in this situation so that whilst we had I know the condition that's already been uh, that, that's been adopted by or adopted as part of the current proposal that we're debating um, but that effectively would back that up by not being able to turn the windows into French doors etc is that something we could potentially also condition here as well I know we've done it in the past for other um, um, developments that I've sat on if we were going to condition it anyway, that it was to be obscure glaze and no opening lights below 1.7, you're pretty much covering that uh, in entirety anyway. Um, because then, obviously, there wouldn't be much point in putting a... Uh, if, if it was a, um, a Juliet balcony, which is the one which is onto the room, uh, that would prevent that. If it was any raised platform where you could actually walk out, that would require planning permission completely separately anyway. Any other member? No? Okay. So the recommendation is to grant planning permission, obviously with the added amendment in terms of obscure glaze thing. I move to the vote. Show of hands. Four. That's eight. Against? Any abstentions? One abstention. That's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. So just, just to show that while, while Victoria goes and gets the next speakers.
Good evening. Um, we're on to item two. Um, there is no fire alarm expected this evening, so if the fire alarm does go off, it's for real and we'll follow the officers out. Okay. If you need any assistance, just ask. Uh, when it comes to your speaking, you're allowed to speak for three minutes. I will be quite strict on the three minutes. And after that you've spoken for three minutes, I will ask if any of the members wish to clarify any points you've made. Okay, well, thank you. Item two, then, Jackie. Thank you, Chair. This is a full planning application for the proposed employment development of 6,953 square metres of B1, which is light industrial, which now falls in Class E, B2, which is general industrial, and B8, storage and distribution uses. It includes parking, access, and landscaping. The site is uh, roughly a triangular piece of land bounded by Longford Road to the east, just there, uh, Wilson's Lane and the strategic housing allocation to the northwest. That's the Wilson's Lane and the strategic housing allocation is further over here and the M6 to the southwest. Electricity pylons run across the site in a roughly southeast to northwesterly direction and is a constraint to this development of the site. That's the pylons going across there. The land is currently a field with hedgerows, trees and small pond on the eastern edge. There have been four neighbour objections from three addresses and two objections from Coventry City Council councillors, uh, councillors J Biggin and councillors G Duggins. The comments are preceded on page 26 of your agenda. Notwithstanding the objections received, this application is being reported to committee at the request of Councillor Damon Brown. You will see on the addendum that whilst he could not attend the meeting tonight, he would like to record his support for this application. He states he considers it will provide much needed skilled job opportunities for the area and help new businesses establish themselves in the bed of the area. In terms of the principle of, of development, national guidance states there is a presumption in favour of sustainable development and that applications should be approved if in accordance with the development plan, which in this case is the borough plan. This principle is also embedded in core policies of the borough plan. The site is allocated as providing two hectares of strategic employment site known as EMP6 of the borough plan. Therefore, the principle of the application is strongly established within the borough plan as a strategic site and carries significant weight in favour of the proposal. The concept plan for the whole area of the adjacent strategic housing allocation, HSG6, and this employment site, EMP6, is in the middle of the slide, that one there. The part that relates to just to this site is enlarged on the right hand side of the slide. On the left is the proposed layout for this application. The concept plan shows the entire EMP6 site being developed for employment use, except for the Wayleaf corridor under the power lines, which was intended to be open space and was largely led by the constraint of the power lines to the development. The proposed application plans before you have been developed during the application process and whilst they show some of the land under the power lines as open space, it has been deemed necessary to use some of this space for manoeuvring and car parking areas. None of the built form will be under the power lines and the concept plan, paragraph 2.5.3 and the key development principles within the borough plan, number 22, for this site states the way leave could be used for parking or storage associated with the employment use. Hedgerows on the boundaries are to be reta retained and enhanced and a landscape buffer retained to the M6 which is all in keeping with the concept plan. 
The proposal includes a new pond. The concept plan states that the existing pond should be retained if possible. It's actually there. Um, however, bearing in mind the constraints of the site, full justification has been given that the existing pond be drained and a new pond be provided. The concept plan is just that, it's a concept plan and provides broad guidance in order to uh, commence discussions on bringing sites forward. Officers consider that the layout is largely in compliance with the concept plan and necessary to facilitate the proposed employment strategic use. In terms of employment growth, the borough plan, policy E1, seeks to bring forward employment land as I say, for B1, which now falls under class E, B2 and B8, on this strategic site. The proposal is in line with this and, again, weighs in favour of the proposal. In terms of impact to the Greenbelt, the site was largely removed from the Greenbelt uh, for the purposes of the strategic site. The inspector for the borough plan, in his final report, clearly supported this site coming forwards for employment land, and his comments are at the bottom of page 27 and the top of page 22 of the agenda. There's a very small triangle to the southwest of the site, which has been retained as Greenbelt. That's that area there. The area is to remain open to provide green infrastructure for biodiversity improvements and provision of the new pond and is consistent with Greenbelt use. In relation to the impact on residential amenity, there are no residential units currently nearby, although the site to the north, as I say, is allocated for houses and approval for part of this northern site has been approved. Any new residential land would be separated from the employment land by Wilson's Lane and Green Space. The Council's environmental health team have been consulted and have no concerns over noise. It is therefore considered that there would be no unacceptable harm to any nearby residential properties. In terms of visual amenity, National and local policy encourages good design responding to local character. The new employment units applied for are relatively large and utilitarian, although they do have some good design elements such as canopies, porches, modern planning and interest with glazing. And the proposals are in keeping with Groveland's industrial estate on the opposite side of the road and the new units to the north on School Lane. The units range from 6.8 to 9 metres to the eaves and between 9 metres to 10.5 metres to the ridge. There are four main buildings being applied for which are intended to be subdivided and although some are close to Longford Road, they are stepped to allow for small green buffers which together with the easement of the power lines will present a sense of openness. Overall, it's considered that the proposal should not cause any significant harm to the visual amenity of the area. In relation to the impact on biodiversity and open space, national and local policy states the need to minimise the impact of development on biodiversity as well as contributing to it, and for the need to protect priority species and habitat. An ecological impact assessment has been submitted and assessed by the Council's Parks team who have requested conditions be applied to the scheme and which have been added to the conditions on the ag agenda. Biodiversity impact calculations have been provided and part of the offsetting will be provided by marsh and wetland habitat and the new proposed pond within the site which will enhance the adjacent highways uh, wildlife, Highways England Wildlife Corridor, that there. Notwithstanding this, the Council's park assessment of the calculation shows there needs to be a contribution of 70,609 towards off-site biodiversity for a wildflower meadow and reedbed enhancement in order to provide a net gain. Parks advised they could not support the scheme if the contributions were not met. This is discussed later in the report. In relation to air quality, the site is not within an air quality management area, but objections refer to the fact it is in proximity to the city-wide AQMA within Coventry's area, 
although this is over 230 metres away and separated from the site by the elevated M6 motorway and railway line and other built highway infrastructure. The applicant has contended that no air quality assessment uh, is required and officers and the council's environmental health officers agree with this subject to the conditions in accordance with the council's adopted air quality SPD. In terms of impact uh, on highway safety, there will be a single point access off Longford Road and which is in compliance with the key development principles of policy EMP6 and which states significant junction improvements and improvements to the wider area will be required. The key development principles specific for this employment site are set out on the slide in green before you. National and local policy development has to be sustainable. This was assessed as part of bringing this strategic site forward for the borough plan. It's considered the site is sustainable and the borough plan inspector reiterated the sustainability of this particular site. See your agenda, page 31 and 32. A transport assessment and road safety audit has been submitted and Warwickshire Highways consider that the proposal is acceptable subject to conditions and a financial obligation. Warwickshire County Council Highways have advised that works will be required on Longford Road to accommodate the needs of sites within the borough plan. This will include works within land owned by the applicant to which the applicant has agreed to. Further financial contributions will be required from other sites to enable the work. Highways England have also commented and requested a condition regarding hedgerows near to their land in their ownership. Overall, it's considered that the proposal will have no significant detrimental impact on highway safety. In terms of flooding and drainage, policy requires consideration is given to flood risk both within and because of the site. The site is in flood zone, least likely to flood. A flood risk assessment was submitted and Warwickshire County Council Flood Risk Management have no objections subject to conditions. The Environment Agency have not responded, which is not unusual when they consider there are no issues that affect them. It is considered that with conditions proposed within the agenda that the impact on flood risk is acceptable. In relation to impact on heritage and archaeology, policy requires that consideration is given to the borough's heritage assets. An archaeological evaluation report was submitted and Warwickshire Archaeology have no objection subject to the condition again included on your agenda. In terms of planning obligations, the MPPF and local policy requires that planning obligations should be considered where otherwise unacceptable development could be made acceptable, but that contributions have to meet three tests to ensure the requests are necessary, directly related to the scheme, and fair and reasonable in scale. Two such requests have been made for this scheme, and which are at the bottom of the slide in grey and white. The first one, or well, the, the, the first one is for highways improvements, and the second one underneath that is the biodiversity that I was referring to. The applicant has undertaken a viability assessment and which the council had independently scrutinised by the district valuations office. These concluded that the scheme would not be viable with all the contributions requested, but that contributions totalling £50,000 would still make the scheme viable. This was partly due to abnormal construction costs, including over £505,000 required by Western Power. The applicant owns some land which has been highlighted as strategically important by the Highways Authority planned for improvements to Longford Road and the applicant has offered this land in lieu of the £50,000 which could benefit Warwickshire Highways and the wider area. An extract of the slide in the middle shows the land dotted in blue required for the potential future highway works. 
The Highways Authority are yet to confirm whether they, they require the payment or the land, and it is intended these discussions can continue after any resolution to approve by Planning Committee. The final agreed option can then be included in the Section 106 legal agreement. Both officers and the applicant are happy with this approach. Whilst it's regret regrettable that more contributions cannot be sought financially, national guidance and case law does mean that viability has to be taken into consideration when balancing benefits of any scheme to allow for reduced or sometimes the emission of the requirements for contributions. In conclusion, the scheme sets out a small but important strategic employment allocation in the borough plan and national and local policy promotes presumption in favour of sustainable development unless material considerations indicate otherwise. The site is considered sustainable and is in a well-connected area close to the M6. The proposal will attract jobs and investment to the area. It's a shame that not more obligations can be sought but on balance, whilst there are small considerations which these are small considerations which weigh against the proposal, those in favour of it clearly outlay any harm created. The proposal is therefore recommended for approval subject to conditions on the agenda and a legal agreement. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Move on to the speakers. Mr Pritchard. You press the big button. Can you, can you hear me? Is that OK? Right, thank you very much. Um, good evening, Chair. Good evening, Members. My name is David Pritchard from Marin's Planning. I speak on behalf of the applicant. As the committee report has made clear, the application proposal will deliver a key strategic employment site within the adopted borough plan, resulting in the provision of some 7,000 square metres of new employment development. It will contribute towards meeting the economic development needs of the borough by providing new high quality industrial and commercial accommodation likely to be attractive to local companies and to inward investment resulting in the creation of new local job opportunities. The committee report records that being an allocated site for the use proposed the development is wholly acceptable in principle. The development accords with the concept plan, the development accords with the expectations for economic growth set out in the borough plan and being allocated for the development proposed, it will have minimal impact on the Greenbelt with no harms in terms of residential or visual amenity. And that having regard to all material considerations, that on balance, the benefits of the proposal clearly outweigh any possible harm. In its introduction, the committee report notes that the site is constrained. It is triangular in shape, limiting its development potential. It is bisected by electricity power lines running across the central part of the site under which no built development can occur. And on the southern boundary of the site is a further triangle of greenbelt land, which also cannot accommodate any built development. That effectively fragments the larger two hectare site into a smaller number of difficult to develop development parcels. In addition, the development capacity of the site has been further constrained by the requirements in design terms to keep built development away from the Longford Road frontage required to allow for the future widening of that part of the highway to accommodate the proposed Sustrans route and the widening of Longford Road as part of the proposed improvement of the highway network to accommodate the wider development needs of the borough. The widening of Longford Road will require land currently forming part of the EMP6 site and in the ownership of the applicant to be made available subject to agreement to the highway authority. The design of the application proposals have been specifically therefore formulated so as to allow for these highway improvements and for the land required for the works to be made available to the highway authority. With regard to any developer contributions, the viability of the proposed development has been independently assessed by the district valuer who has concluded, as set out in the committee report, that any contribution above £50,000 will render the scheme unviable. It is considered that the committee report fairly and accurately sets out all relevant considerations bearing upon the determination of the application and that the conclusions of officers that permission should be granted subject to conditions under Section 106 agreement is a conclusion shared by the applicant. It is therefore respectfully requested that you endorse the recommendation made by your officers and resolve that permission should be granted. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any member need to seek clarification? No? 
Okay. Mr. David Carr. Oh, okay. I'm not here to object to the principle of this development because I don't think that would be appropriate. The development became inevitable when Inspector Spencer at the Borough Plan Inquiry agreed to remove so many sites from the Greenbelt, largely on the evidence of the joint Greenbelt study, a document which redrew Greenbelt boundaries in a way I think was a good example of gerrymandering. Instead, I want to object because of the so-called improvements which have been proposed for Longford Road. If there is one thing we could have hoped for from this development, it would be that the terrible traffic problems, which we have suffered for so many years as a result of the scandalous ne neglect of this road, would finally be resolved. The School Lane Baton Road junction is potentially lethal, thanks to its appalling sight lines, and is the scene of frequent accidents. The northbound lane of Longford Road, from the M6 overpass up to this junction, is frequently at a standstill, in fact, it's not uncommon to have traffic queuing all the way back under the overpass onto Picard's Way towards Junction 3 of the M6. It's obvious that, that this road should have been made four lanes many years ago, and the land was available to do so. However, when the Black Horse Inn was demolished, the council, in its wisdom, allowed a warehouse to be built on the site, close to the road, preventing any further widening on that side. I pointed this out at the Borough Plan Inquiry, but it was deemed to be not a problem because widening could take place on the western side. So I was optimistic when I looked at Warwickshire Highway's latest plans for improvements to Longford Road, but I was staggered by what I found. They are proposing that the southbound side, where there is rarely queuing traffic, be increased from one lane to two, and the northbound side, which is so frequently at a standstill, stays as a single lane. And worse than that, there will be a right turn lane for southbound traffic to enter the site across the single no northbound lane, so the traffic problems can only get immeasurably worse. The borough plan says that development of this site should provide traffic improvements and upgrades to Longford Road, not downgrades. I can't help thinking that this design has been produced by some apprentice traffic planner sitting at a computer terminal in an office miles away who's never visited the site and has no appreciation of the awful traffic problems we currently have, and probably has no idea how much worse they will get with the addition of this site, plus 129 new houses on School Lane, 500 more on the old golf course at Hawkesbury, to say nothing of the allocation of 26 hectares for industrial development of Bowling Green Lane. I think this application should be paused until such time as a sensible plan is produced for improvements to the traffic infrastructure in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carr. Any member got any points of clarification? No? Thank you. You can turn off your oh. microphone. Thank you very much. Before we move to debate, are members happy with the comments from officers in terms of viability? Because if you need any more information, we would have to go into closed session. That's the officers are concerned about confidentiality. So if I could just check with that. Councillor Condicor. Thank you, Chair. I did ask the officers about viability and they did send me a, a document. Um, do we need to actually um, keep the figures in that confidential? Um, I, I think the viability is an important thing. So I would personally like us to discuss the viability and go into closed session if other members want to discuss the viability. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I suppose it depends what level of detail you want to go into in terms of the viability assessment. Now, the other members of the committee have not seen that summary document. Um, we'd have to discuss with the applicant what we can disclose. Normally, um, you don't disclose um, the viability appraisal. This was obviously a summary, so my understanding is that that could be disclosed. But I think in reality, if we're looking at detailed questions as officers, we're not going to be in a position to be able to answer those questions. And indeed, we might be um, in a position where we'd have to get the district valuer in to, to assist because it, it, it's obviously quite a specialist area. So it really depends what level of detail um, you, uh, Councillor Condacore, or other members might be wishing to go into in terms of that viability, are you able to allude to that? If 
it helps you, I mean, the, the applicant's trying to be let off £700,000 of highway funding, so I do think it's important to talk about the numbers and what they can afford. Thank you. Councillor Bilson. Thank you, Chair. I understand the concern about letting the developers off for 750 odd thousand pounds of section 106 is in fact it makes me balk slightly at the prospect however i don't see on what grounds any of us are qualified to make the determination as to what is or is not justifiable in including in, the, in, in including in those calculations the district valuer i would assume is a man or woman steeped in God knows how many letters after their name and uh, sufficient experience to make that determination. I might not necessarily like what they've determined, but I don't see on what basis I can challenge them. It'd be like going into court and challenging a judge without knowing the law. Um, it's not my area of expertise and I don't believe any member of this uh, committee or indeed our officers, in all fairness, are qualified to make that determination. So I have to take the figures provided in open session, I believe, on face value. What I then use that information for is what I use to, to make a judgment on the actual application. So I would oppose going into private session on this case. I don't see what value it would add. Councillor Wormsley. Thank you, Chair. Um, perhaps I might just be helpful with, if, if Jackie, you could just clarify a couple of things I think you said earlier. One, it's been to the district valuer and that they have made a determination of what they believe is a um, viable amount to contribute. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. The reason why we use the district value are, are, is because they're totally independent uh, and they look at it. They're, they're obviously trained surveyors uh, and they look at it independently. They're not airing on our side. They're not airing on the, um, the, the, the applicant side. They are purely looking at the figures provided and going through those figures. And they have confirmed um, it was because mainly of the Western power requiring so much when the actual uh, quotation came through of Western power requiring uh, for uh, contacting to services that that is when at the point when it became unviable except for 50,000 so we have clarified it we've also got them to carry out sensitivity tests as well um, for that so it was just a case of they'll do an initial test saying is it viable viable or not viable and then we ask for further work and then they go into into the sensitivity testing to see what uh, what can be provided, if at all, and that's the level we've gone to on this. Councillor Walmsley. Thank you, Chair. I think you gave the figure before. Could you reiterate the figure that is gone to Western Power? Because I, I do remember you saying it in your sorry, I remember you saying it in your presentation. I do remember thinking it was quite a sum. So could you just um, reiterate that for me, Jackie? Yeah. So yeah, just just over half a million five. Thanks. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, when they were originally actually getting quotations as part of the assessment. Uh, it, it wasn't anticipated that it would be so much, and that's what's come about because it's now an actual fixed price rather than just an estimate and that is what has thrown the sensitivity testing to where it is now thank you chair very last one um obviously we've had that feedback back there's also the detail that underlying that and that supports that with the local authority being supplied obviously with the district valuation office's opinion um has there been any response from county council um, at this stage to that, um, I think you alluded sort of to it that said that they were happy to discuss about money or land in lieu or what you know variations as part of the 106. Have they sort of said they're content? They don't have any challenge to what the district valuer has said then. There's no been no sort of appeal or not even appeal, but no sort of um, uh, comment um, from the county council in that respect. Because I think the biggest one to lose obviously seems to be 
from what I can from what, what I can see that is is, is obviously um, the, the highways element, which is quite some sum. So effectively, you know, it would be for Warwickshire County Council to present an argument then um, if the scheme couldn't go ahead because this money was not eligible. For example, um, have we had anything to that that um, to, to anything to similar to that following the DV district valuation officers um, report determination, as it were? They would be in the same position as us, basically. They would have to employ uh, valuers to go over the, the details themselves. Um, but um, what uh, w what we have had discussions with them, as I say, is the, the two alternatives is that they, the, they, they can have the land, uh, which is part of the land on the site for widening purposes, or the 50,000, that is still with them up to today. Um, they haven't come back to confirm which one of those that they would require, which is why, as I say, one of them will be put in the legal agreement, but we don't know which ones yet. So are members happy that we continue with the debate? I don't need to go into private session. Show our hands, please. To say to, to not go into private session. Against? Thank you. That's carried. So, to enable debate, can I have a member to move the recommendations to grant planning permission and a seconder, please? Councillor Evans, Councillor Walmsley, move the debate. Any member? Councillor Condacore. Thank you, Chair. This is really a dreadful piece of road at the moment. I have had the misfortune of cycling down it. I've had the misfortune of actually once catching a buzz from the bus stop, just about where the entrance is to this site. And it really does need improvement. So if the application was to improve the road and build an industrial estate, uh, I'm sure it would get a lot of support. Um, but what it is, it's to build an industrial estate, and then we'll see what we're doing with the road afterwards, but we haven't got any money for it. Um, and I'm very dubious of this because we could end up with um, an entrance and exit on t halfway down, no way of people exiting the site at the top or the bottom, you know, pedestrians and cyclists. So everything's dumped out in the middle on the eastern side, is it? Um, into what is actually one of the most polluted parts of road in the borough. It, it, it talks in the report about not being an air quality management area but we only measure where there's housing. So where there's no housing, we have absolutely no measurements at all to, to, to show how bad the air quality is on this section. It would be really nice if we could actually um, have the County Council come to the meeting, and, and we have in the past, actually tell us what they're planning, particularly for the cycling and the widening, so we can actually be reassured that actually we are going to make a sustainable development and not make a bad situation worse. Um, and I would really like this deferred till we actually make progress on the County Council telling us what their plans and if, if it's viable, um, rather than approving a house, a, 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 an employment site, which will just make matters considerably worse. So I don't know if other members are considering um, getting more details and some clarity from the County Council, but I, I'm not happy to um, vote for this at the moment uh, uh, until I know more about how it's going to be safe. Uh, and reading the data with the planning application, there's accident reports. There's three cyclist accidents along this section, multiple road users, and, and the, the um, speaker spoke of the problems at the traffic light just to the north. Uh, and I say I'm, I'm most concerned that we're, we're only seeing half the picture before we approve it. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> So, are you moving that deferment as a recommendation, Council if, if, if it would find a seconder, yeah, I'd, I'd like the County Council to um, move forward and tell us what the, the highway plans are and defer it till we find out. Okay. So, is there a seconder for Councillor Condacore deferment? Let's know that well, Councillor Condacore. Any other members? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, two items, really, to, to clarify. Well, one comment. I think it's very good that actually the developer has sought to, from the beginning, 
provide some sort of clear way for a potential of a uh, um, uh, widening of of the road. Whether what the county council does with it is what people want is a different matter. That is a question for the county council. That's not a question for us, and it's not a question for the applicant as to what the county council does or doesn't decide to do in respect of lanes up, lanes down, width of lanes, all those kind of parameters. They will be done by the county. But what I think is is very good foresight is actually for the developer to keep this particular section clear when there would be very little in my mind that could we could stop them doing that, you know, which could cause problems down the line for potential development. So I think that's quite welcomed here. The only question I would have is in respect of the various units that are listed as 1A, B, C and 2. Noting obviously at some point as part of the borough plans potential for properties on the other side of Wilson's Lane, um, whether there would be anything we could condition on those units about them not being able to be refrigerated. Um, I know, I don't think they are from the current plans um, and whether you could or would is probably a different matter. But um, I know from many experience that a lot of the complaints about these kind of units tends to come with refrigeration units clicking on and clicking off all day. Um, it's the same with lorry parks, etc. It's one of the biggest gripes I think residents have in respect of, um, um, in respect of, of um, industrial units. And whether there's anything we could do to condition um, that those could not necessarily be used as refrigeration. I don't think we could condition that they couldn't be used for refrigeration. You're re referring to the uh, noise, are you, aspect. We could condition to say that any external plant would require additional consent. There would be no issue with that. And then we'd be looking at noise and we'd be looking, obviously, amenity as well. And obviously, for some of the other units close to the alterations, we could be looking at the potential impacts on that um, potential widen as well. But I think that's that's the approach you would have to take if you wanted to uh, if if you wanted to consider that. Thank you, Chair. Well, in which case, you know, trying to foresee potential problems down the line that the local authority may get, can I so move then about the um, the condition as, as suggested by Jackie in respect of external plant works requiring further consent at a later date? Um, and again, I think you know, my reasoning for such would be actually um, the, one of the large things for me would be that potential of out external noisy um, units, potentially depending on the houses in the future. Um, so it's just something we could reserve to ourselves for, for future for application, um, if that's so fine. A seconder. Thank you, Chair. Is there a seconder? Councillor Condacle. If that can be added on to the conditions yeah we can add that condition that's fine yeah thank you chair and, and uh, yes I think that's a very good condition that I support um when I when I first looked at this this application uh the first thing that you know comes to my mind was uh the road uh, Longford Road which I know very well I I think in this case, I think the the applicant has gone some way to try and overcome some of, some of those problems. But the reality is that Warwickshire County Council has not provided an objection to this application. And I know, Mr. Parr, you were probably joking to some extent, but the reality is that an officer from Warwickshire County Council has probably sat behind a computer screen and come to his or her's view that way and it, it does really annoy me but the, the reality is they've done a road safety audit um they haven't objected and if we were to defer or object on the grounds of highways i, I don't think we would have a leg to stand on in front of the planning inspectorate um I, I do think the county council needs to get its act together and actually come out with some proper plans for this part of bedworth particularly at the, the cross-section onto the um, uh, industrial estate, Baton Road. Um, I, I do foresee this becoming a problem after this application is, is, is built, um, but w without 
that support from county, there's nothing we can do. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Chair. First of all, I have to take issue with page 26 of the report where a councillor, George Duggins, who happens to be the Labour leader of Coventry City Council, is raising an objection. I find it the height of hypocrisy, really, that he is commenting on an application within the Neenham Bedworth boundaries um, when he is refusing to discuss with us at all about the impacts of his council's plans on the local plan and our local plan and the what Councilor, has since can we stick to the I, I am sticking to it because I, I am sticking uh, chair because his objection is and the, the primary one is congestion is common in the area um well there would be less congestion if there were less houses and less requirements to be built which are being forced onto us chair so I won't take any notice of Councillor Duggins until he actually starts to engage with reality and negotiates in a fair way. Um, on the application itself, I don't necessarily like the viability report, but I am in no position to question that viability report. Um, it sounds to me as if the applicant has engaged in a constructive way in trying to determine the viability of that. No doubt the officers would tell us if they were not supplying documents, et cetera, et cetera. So I know sometimes that tends to be a bugbear of the committees, and it is a bugbear of mine, actually, the, the whole viability um, debate, but it is a matter that I have to consider because that's what the planning legislation says. Um, would I rather have the £750,000? Yes, I would. But I also have to balance that against the fact that this site will create jobs within the borough, uh, much needed jobs for some people, particularly as we are emerging from COVID and people have lost their jobs through the pandemic. And this would be a way potentially of getting them back into employment eventually. And also, we do know that more people commute outside of the borough for uh, employment purposes than actually stay within the borough and this may help to go some way to redressing that balance so it is a balancing act chair and you have to place your different weights in each side of the scale um, and one of the biggest weights has to be the fact that the, the planning inspector has approved this at the borough plan um, and there is no way around that until we have a viable refreshed reviewed borough plan so, as much as I would love to have that £750,000, Councillor Evans is absolutely right. Unless Warwickshire County Council raises an objection, and there is none in the papers, we have nothing to hang our hats on at a, at a potential appeal. And again, we would be looking at potentially six-figure sums um, in terms of costs against us at a time when we need to be prioritising frontline services, Chair. So, I will vote for it, but it is a balancing act, Chair. Not been and no other members indicated, so I'm moving to the recommendation to grant planning permission subject to legal agreement and conditions printed. All those in favour, please show. Uh, oh, with the addition. So, all members show. All members show our hands. That's ten. Against? That's one that's carried. Thank you. Thank you for your time. So if you can have to make the amount of people today, then I'm going to ask my mother to make the amount of people today.
We're not at all. So, thank you, Sam. In terms of the fire alarm, we're not ex expecting the drill, so the fire alarm does go off, it's just for real, so we'll need to follow the officers out. In three, you get three minutes to speak. I will be quite strict on the three minutes. And then I will ask members if you've got any points of clarification for yourself. But first, the officer will present the report. So, over to yourself, Jackie. Thank you, Chair. This is for the retention of a hardcore access track to provide access to equitation grazing land to the rear of 162 to 180 Marston Lane. The application has come about following an enforcement complaint about the access. The land is designated as Greenbelt. The access track is shown as grey shading on the slide there and leads down to a field which the agent states is grazing land for the applicant's horses. The bottom photograph is looking down the track towards the grazing fields and the top photograph is looking back up the track towards the houses. The applicant states the track has been put in as the existing track from the stable gets muddy and churned up and makes it difficult to, uh, for the tractor to get to the grazing land. A wooden fence has been erected, as you can see on the slides, on one, for, on one side and on the opposite side of the access road is a new post and rail fence, neither of which require planning permission. There have been seven objections from two addresses, as well as one objection with no address provided. The comments are summarised on page 66 of the agenda. There has also been a petition of seven signatories objecting to the severe impact on residents and that the track is unnecessary and if approved, heavy vehicles will be driving immediately adjacent to properties. A petition, a petition in support of the application has been received and is shown on the addendum. The key issues to assess in the determination of this application are set before you on the slide, top left hand corner. In relation to the impact to the openness and permanence of the Greenbelt, the MPPF considers that certain types of development on the Greenbelt is appropriate as long as it does not affect this sense of openness. One of these are for engineering works, which a road would be engineering works. Greenbelt case law refers to the visual aspect of development in Greenbelt from the public realm and that where the development can only be seen from private land that it would not materially harm the landscape. The access terminates onto an existing track at the back of the houses, which you can see there. In the adjacent field to the east, there are buildings that are almost the entire length of the access road and hedgerow, which limits views to the east. To the south, the houses shield the views from Marston Lane. The field to the north is the grazing land with no rights of way in proximity to the access track and with a hedgerow separating the track from the fields. It is considered that the proposal therefore does not affect the openness of the green belt. In terms of appropriate development for the green belt, this states that special circumstances will not exist unless the potential harm is outweighed and then only in very special circumstances. The agent states that the track is required to provide access to the grazing land used for equitation, outdoor sports and recreation, and therefore, uh, there, therefore equitation is considered an appropriate use within the MPPF and Greenbelt local policy. The specification of the track is a crushed stone sub-base finished with planings with no membrane so that grass will ultimately grow through it. This specification is consistent with the Countryside Stewardship Governance website. In relation to supporting a prosperous rural economy, the MPPF states the need to promote development and diversification of agriculture and other land-based rural business. The access track would make the equitation use easier to manage. The supporting documentation states the applicant has used an informal access track for 10 years and the surfacing is required as it gets muddy. These facts have been disputed by local residents. 
but the application is purely for the retention of the track as it stands today, rather than how long it's been there or whether it gets muddy. In relation to highway safety, the access from Marston Lane and to the back of the houses, and which also serves existing and proposed stables, has been in place for many years and is not part of this application. Never, nevertheless, it is included in the red line as legislation states that as the red line has to be shown to be continued up to an adopted road. The application is for a new access track that spurs off the existing access and um, which is under another person's ownership. Local residents' concerns are that the new track will be used for HGVs. This current application is for the existing equitation use. Any other commercial use would likely not be acceptable in Greenbelt and it's considered that restricting the track to equitation use is considered appropriate. County Highways were consulted due to neighbours' concerns about highway safety and Highways responded to advise that whilst the existing track was not considered suitable for intensified use, that the new track serving an existing purpose and would therefore unlikely increase vehicular movements and therefore concluded that they had no objection. Therefore, refusal on highway grounds would be difficult to defend at appeal. In conclusion, opinion, uh, the Council's opinion that as highways have no objection, that the use is appropriate for the Greenbelt and would not affect the openness of the Greenbelt, that's subject to the conditions set out in page 69 of the agenda and the amendment in the addendum, that the rec recommendation is therefore of approval. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jackie. Moving on to the speakers, Mr Brooks. The big button, the big red button, the big button on your console. Oh, sorry. Your big, the big button on your console. If you press, then you can, they can hear you. Okay. Okay, I know I've only got three minutes, but I've got about 30 hours worth here. Right. Mrs. Tasker does not own any land in Marston Lane. Right. The land in question is owned by me, and I have it on my deeds. It is not required by law to register all land, right? It is a recommendation. It only gets registered when it's sold. It's on my deeds that actually explain it does belong to me. The land isn't supposed to be cleared. She cleared that while I was in Tenerife, right? I had the police down. I contacted Craig Tracy. I contacted Gilbert, Chris Gilbert. I contacted Mr. Hancock 15, 20 times. I've had the police down, right? She hasn't known that. If I've got the solicitor, involved with it, right, and they've allocated 50,000 to 100,000 pounds and they've took it up because they've seen my deeds and everything else. She has no right of way down the back, right, that's me. Land registry, when I actually purchased the land, my own land, 190 Marston Lane. She has no vehicle access whatsoever, it's on my deeds, she's got put foot passage, as all those cottages have, to the back of the house to empty a dustbin or to deliver fencing, right? That was on the, that's on the deeds and everything else. The land should not be cleared because there's a ditch there that actually goes into two ponds at the bottom that are actually dry at the moment. That's three foot higher than mine, right? She's cleared that and I'm saying illegally, right? She was told about it, like the police down. She's cleared it, all that, right? Because she's now she's claiming retrospective permission. Chris Gilbert came out I think it was November time, and he actually saw the land wasn't even clean. She hadn't even got access to get to it. She bulldozed the fence down to get to it, cleared all the stuff out of the way. They wouldn't even contribute, even for the foot passage, because that's on my deeds, they're supposed to. So it did overgrow, and if you look on Google Earth, right, which is a government site, you'll see that the land wasn't being used by her. She's telling lies, right? I've got lots more down here, but obviously, I reckon that she sublets the land of the church, which I used to. She cannot use it and sublet it, right? She, she rents it, but she cannot, by, by their licenses, sublet, which she's doing. She's erected further stables down the bottom and put all rails round, which I don't know if she's got planned permission to do that, right? Which, but she hasn't got no access to that at all, right? And I've got the a previous owner of the other, they'll actually state 
with my solicitor at court, when it goes to court, that she's never cleaned that land, she's never attended it, until she went to auction with the, the owner, and they found out it was unregistered, right? That land and the land of the other side, which by their stables, was unregistered, and it's not a requirement by law, gentlemen and ladies, right? It's not a requirement by law to register land. It's a recommendation, and there's nearly 40% of land in this country not registered, right? And it won't get registered until 2030. Okay? And I've got all the documentations if anybody wants, anybody wants to look at it. Well, you can turn your microphone off for me. Oh, sorry. Wonderful. Thank you. Any member got any points of clarification? No. Good evening, council members. Uh, I sh I sh I'll try and be as quick as I can. Uh, under the Town and Country Planning Act 1990, as I'm sure you're all aware, section 65, you cannot make materially false information or even mislead. I have here dated the 4th 11th 20 from Google Earth. This, this sorry, this, You'll be able to see if you've got the coordinates. I have contacted the, the church who are, actually own Mrs. Tasker's property. They have stated to me on multiple occasions that this, by, the, um, by the, where the graveyard is, look, the cemetery, I don't know if anyone knows where Marston Lane is. There's a side of a very steep hill. Then there's the, the gra Marston Lane graveyard. Then there's the field. If you go next to the graveyard, there's a yellow fence, like a gate. That's her fence, that's her gate. She has access already. All she has to do is clear it and she can get all into the field. So, so that's, that's from, the, and that can be verified from the, from the church. So it is beyond question. She's also stated at one point that uh, no agricultural use, because obviously you have to declare on the form that there's no agricultural use and then she's saying it's an agricultural site you can't have it both ways it's either an agricultural site or it isn't that's a materially false fact under the uh, as i say under the town and country planning act it's a level five civil fine between five thousand pounds and unlimited she has made factually erroneous information either misleading or deliberate I've been there, my mother's been there since 2010. My, my father-in-law, my father-in-law has been there since the, since the Second World War. At no point, and there's video evidence, at no point has she used that path ever. The only time she's used that path was to clear it with, by, with Mr. Nicholson whilst you were away. Because I witnessed it. Because when it first came out, he literally drove up with a barrow full of, because he's a tarmac consultant, the, the other gentleman. He brought come up with a tarmac and said, you can't do that, you've got no planning permission. He then came to my house and says, we can either do it the easy way or the other way. Everything I've claimed can be verified because I've gone to fix my street and the planning will know me very, very well because I've made a point of making every time they've gone without planning permission, every time they've made... There's a horse mirror down there. They've had to have uh, environmental. They've had dogs. They're breeding dogs on there. As uh, <laughs> any member got any points of clarification? No? Thank you. Mr Hinky. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name's Dr. David Hickey, and I'm a planning consultant on behalf of the, the applicants here. I'd just like to correct a, a, a number of, of things put forward uh, by, by, by the last, uh, my last colleague. One, it's access, it's going for access from the stables down to that far field. At the moment, that slope there that I, I, we've got on the plan there gets churned up, and it's not easy to get down. So, it's not really coming out onto the road, it's actually going from the stables, around the existing track and down there, providing a good, so that they can get hay for the uh, horses in that part of the field. So just to correct that. 
the agricultural land use, well, as you know, everything outside a settlement boundary, in planning terms, is agricultural land use. So that's why we quite correctly labelled it as such. Um, and we do have photographs of the, uh, the applicant using a horse and cart to actually get down there, accepting that it wasn't a vehicle, but in agriculture terms, a horse and cart is, is perfectly okay to have used. In terms of the neighbour responses, in planning terms, there's clearly uh, uh, um, no major uh, problem with this. The actual, uh, uh, going through the neighbour's responses on page uh, 66. So the first one is, the land is not owned by the applicant. Well, the applicant has used the, the land for over 10 years and is the owner of this. Now, curiously, Mr. Brooks has never put forward a land registry document in front of me or the council that shows that he owns it. I'd be quite happy to see that. I've never seen that. So it is quite correct for Mrs. Tasker to say she is the owner. Um, talks about the land previously. Isn't, it wasn't cheered up. Yes, it is. Clearly there. Trees and shrubs were removed. Yes, one or two have been uh, removed. You don't need planning permission that or, uh, with your own land. Stables used commercially. No, obviously, the, the client d d uh, d denies that. Areas to a dumping ground. Well, one or two things have been on there. And Mr. Nicholson, who is a completely separate uh, um, entity to Mrs. T Tasker, who, who owns the central bit, has been bringing in some material for, for, for the works that he's, he's already got planning permission for. Um, commercial vehicles. This is for equestrian use. This is to get from the stables down the far end. You know, it'll be a Land Rover or perhaps even occasionally a horse box trying to get down there. All the deeds on the houses from 162 to 178 show that they've got 10 foot. And what we've got is support for six out of nine of those houses for this. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Any member that need points of clarification? No. To enable debate, can I have a member to move the recommendations as printed and a seconder, please? Any member? Councillor Smith, a seconder. Councillor Walmsley, thank you. Moving to debate, any member? Councillor Evans. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think. There is clearly a problem about the ownership of the land, and clearly you dispute what um, Mrs. Tasker's representative is saying. But my understanding of the matter is that land ownership is a civil matter, and it's not a planning matter. Um, I understand I'm happy to stand correct if, if I'm wrong, but I would be allowed if I wanted to submit a planning application to build a skyscraper in your back garden. Um, the reality of that being approved is very slim, but um, anyone can submit a planning application for any piece of land. So for us, as a committee, what we need to consider is planning matters and potential planning reasons to object to an application. And from what I can see in this report, I can't see any potential reasons to object to it on planning grounds. Um, however, I would encourage you to seek representations from a solicitor, sir, because I, I do believe uh, if you have evidence from the land registry to support what you're saying, you need to challenge that and you need to challenge Mrs. Tasker. But as far as I'm concerned for me personally, I don't see any planning reasons for me, for, for us as the planning authority to object to this. Um, if I could just ask a point of clarification to an officer, under the um, conditions, um, am I right in saying that there would be a condition in place to only allow the track to be used for equestrian purposes only? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> 
That is correct. That's what we're uh, considering as a condition, yeah. Chair, if I may, so if, if it was the case that the applicant decided to use the land for the purposes of dog breeding, that would be something that we would be able to enforce through uh, Chris Gilbert, through planning enforcement, because that wouldn't be allowed. Yes. I'm sorry, you can't, you can't contribute to the meeting anymore, unfortunately, once you've had your three minutes. Martin, can I please ask you not to interrupt the meeting? Thank you very much for your time. Had you finished, Councillor Evans? Yes, we, we were conditioned for equitation. Uh, dog breeding would be a little bit difficult. It, it would be basically if we were to receive a complaint that the access was used for anything else other than for equitation, then we would be looking at it in terms of enforcement. Council Wall. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Um, I have to say, Councillor Evans took much of the words out of my mind before I managed to get to speak to them. Um, I was going to make the very similar principle that we've had applications from um, individuals for example to change use of the town hall for example and you have to hear them and so forth and it's whether or not um an individual that if that application is, is approved it's whether or not the work can be carried out is a different matter um and so i do understand that that, that slight misconception we're not a court um this a committee is not a court it's not here to decide who is or is not the correct owner it's to say any application, as Councillor Evans said, I could put an application to build a skyscraper on top of the town hall if I wanted. Um, the chance of that being approved or not, well, as he says, slim. Um, but so that was probably going to be one of my points, just to uh, I thought would be helpful here. Um, the second question I would ask, though, is obviously given the proximity to the houses, um, given there seems to be a number of what could potentially be tight turns there, there's no reason, for example, why ancillary works to supply a stables could not be quite a large vehicle um you know theoretically there's nothing that says it couldn't be an articulated lorry so long as it was for the purpose of supplying this the 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 equestrian um use is there something we could do about um restriction of um because i know we've done it in the past restriction of hours of heavy goods vehicle movements um, or delivery movements within certain hours. Um, is that potentially a condition that we could add to this application that might therefore mean that we, we don't get deliveries at unsociable hours, etc.? Um, Jackie? You'd have to define, I think, what we mean by HGVs because there's obviously various parts of being HGVs. Yes, we could probably put a condition on if you thought it was reasonable in terms of delivery times um, of using that track for HGVs. I see no reason why we couldn't do that. So, so for clarity, would it be a re would it be a restriction on deliveries? Would that should encompass all of them, shouldn't it? Then, in theoretically, rather than saying restriction on HGVs between this time, it would be a restriction upon deliveries between such hours because I recall a farm um, in Bedworth I think it was turning into an equestrian centre that I sat on from memory where we did do a condition in respect of um, delivery hours um, following concerns that the proximity to, to houses um, so are we saying then we could do a condition upon hours of delivery via this particular um, application on this particular piece of road obviously we couldn't necessarily control the uh, other access, I believe, is a, a secondary access. Um, but we could control the access on this, which would be going obviously behind people's houses. So we could do um, 
do something on delivery hours and is there any sort of guidance as to what generally would be acceptable in terms of the, what hours they may be seven seven eight eight whatever is there any sort of um, opinion that could be given there please don't see any reason why we couldn't uh, condition uh, deliveries using the track um, in terms of hours it depends really what you're trying to protect is it noise is it safety because obviously if it's noise then you wouldn't want to be doing it after seven o'clock at night or before seven o'clock in the morning as opposed to are you saying it it, it, it I think we'd have to understand more the reasons for the conditions and why if it's just vehicles turning down there safety then obviously that is different to 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 noise uh, thank you chair so following on from that i think um given the proximity to the rear of the houses uh, for me it would be noise and um, potentially large um, delivery vehicles, given the agricultural um, and the sort of the equine nature of um, the um, uh, the usage of the land at the end of that track. Um, therefore, um, Chair, if I can move a suggested additional condition, which is um, deliveries to the site not to take place between the hours of 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. on the grounds of obviously um, noise for the properties that. Um, to the rear, uh, to the the bound on to the area. Thanks, Chair. The second condition, receive the second Councillor Evans and Councillor Smith as well. Thank you, Chair. I'm not actually going to comment on the application. I'm going to. My interests are declared in the nature of my employment, given the. Um, shall we say, the acrimonious nature of the um, representations we have received. It seems fairly likely to me this has a strong possibility of going before the civil courts, of which I am the court manager um, here in the Neaton and Warwick. So I am going to recuse myself from considering this application, and can I have it noted in the minutes, uh, please, Chair? I think normally I wouldn't, but it seems that the acrimonious nature of this application gives me a, a strong indication it may end up before me and well not that I'm the decision maker but I could end up coming across this in a professional capacity so I'm going to leave the room whilst the vote takes place Councillor Wilson any other member Councillor Gutteridge thank you chair well, thank you chair uh, I'd like the officer to clarif clarify something for me no neighbours notified and I noticed and I've read it four or five times 109 Coventry Road, Bulkington. Could you tell me why we notified that, please, when it is in Master Lane, Bedworth? Sorry. Yeah, that uh, we know is um, the address of the adjacent land. So we try and cover as when we know addresses and that we know that address because the stables was only uh, determined last year. So when we and when we see certificate B's come in from the applicant, from the agent saying that they've contacted that there's this owner, that owner and that owner being contacted, we will also try and do that as part of the consultation process so that we know we've contacted as many as we can of the people around the site. Thank, thank you. I'd like to just go on a bit further with the vehicle access and the vehicles going proposed to go down the track. Um, I come from an agricultural background and I, for the life of me, cannot see how we can get an Arctic lorry down there to turn, well, to get down there, let alone turn around and come back. I, I, I would be mindful when you say equestrian um, transport that we can we possibly limit it to a Land Rover and a, a horse box, not um, a seven and a half, or three and a half, seven and a half, or an Arctic horse box come living accommodation, because I, I don't think it will do it. And I think what they have put down is not standard, not correct 
for the vehicles that they're hoping to put down there. Um, also, I'd like to pick up on what the gentleman there said about feeding the, um, the horses. Usually on those sort of establishments, they have a building or a stable where they keep the hay and straw and the feed so they don't have to go up and down. So I've got a lot of reservations about this um, uh, and I would like further information on it because uh, as we've just seen tonight, it's, as Mr Chris Wilson has said, it's not cut and dried. I know full well with the land registry because we are going through it, the family is with a, some property upon a personal basis with the land registry and they are way, way, way behind with it. So I, I, I am undecided what to do. I think Ash has just said something that, I, that that was crossing my mind. When we start about conditions, uh, there are various tests that we have to do for conditions. One of those tests is that it's enforceable. Um, unless we've got an enforcement officer standing on that site seven days a week, 24 hours a day, it would be very difficult in terms of the uh, traffic going down there, i.e. Um, horse box, trailer or uh, Land Rover. So I think it would just be very difficult. I think it, it, it is a case of keeping it as equitation use and then conditioning the hours of delivery along there is probably the easy way of doing it. Thank you. I mean, the, the hardcore probably comes from some road job and, yeah, it, it's recycled a lot of this stuff. And my fear is that this site could be used for waste and all sorts of road construction activities, all sorts of other things that are not what's being suggested here. And I don't know if there's a, a simple three tonne or three and a half tonne weight limit we can put on it in terms of vehicles, because obviously you can look up a vehicle license plate and it's an easy to see whether it's above or, or below a certain threshold and uh, you don't need a heavy vehicle to deliver hay um, so I didn't know whether something along those lines would stop it being misused for other purposes if people feared that. Thank you Chair. Jackie. Yeah that, that is the problem I was sort of saying uh, because you can sort of get HGVs with uh, long bases etc uh, etc et so it, it's defining where we go from that. I seem to recall three and a half metres, as I say, is um, three and a half tonne um, is part of the licensing, where above that then you need to go into, in, into extra licensing. And I don't think it would be unreasonable to actually condition in terms of, of, of three and a half tonne. I think that would be relevant. Chair, for you. So I think... I just have concerns. I mean, it, in terms of the reality of us being able to enforce that um, from a physical point of view, so I think from a planning perspective, um, you know, content with the condition as you suggested, but just to manage expectations, you know, how will that be monitored and how would we go away and enforce that in reality is my concern. Um, I think in terms of trying to address those concerns, um, I think we've, it's got to be very precise, and I think that that's probably as precise as you can get it. Um, so from that point of view, I'm content. But just in terms of resource, I'll be quite clear with members of the committee. Um, that is not going to be a difficult, uh, an easy condition to enforce. So, Councillor Conkle, were you? Yeah, listening to what I said, you still yeah. want to move that? Condition? Yeah, can I, can I move that the use is restricted to vehicles of below three and a half tons? Is there a seconder for that? Oh, two, Councillor Gustavich. Thank you. So, I have got no other speakers, so in terms of the recommendations, adding on the condition from Councillor Condacor and the condition from Councillor Wormsley, are we happy? 
for them to go through into the planning conditions. Members happy? Thank you. Show of hands. Thank you very much. That's unanimous. Um, so we move to the recommendation to grant planning permission subject to legal agreements and conditions printed. All those in favour, please show. Oh, isn't it? Sorry, apologies. <laughs> That was eight against two. So that is the recommendation to grant plan permission is approved. Thank you very much for your time. Move on to back to item three. Thank you Chair. This application is for a small dormer with window to the front and a large dormer with windows to the rear to provide rooms within the roof space. It also includes the conversion of the hip roof to a gable roof and a single storey ground extension to the side and rear. The existing and proposed front elevations are shown on the slide as well as the existing photograph of the front. The property is a detached house with a hipped roof built between 1928 and 1939 as a, and is a typical design of the era. To the east and west are dwellings of different designs built at the same time. To the rear is the paddocks, those which is a more modern group houses built in the 1990s. Directly opposite on Western Lane are fields in the Greenbelt. This application has been reported to committee because there have been five objections from four properties, two responses of objections from one property, with address withheld as per the addendum, and one response of comment. The neighbour responses are on page 48 of the agenda and also the addendum. The key issues to assessing the determination of the application are the impact on visual amenity and the impact on residential amenity. In terms of the impact on visual amenity, the Council's Sustainable Design and Construction SPD contains guidance in design and the built form. The only parts of the proposal that will be visible from the public realm will be from Western Lane and will be the slight increase in roof height, hip to gable conversion and the dormer to the front. Both hips are being converted and so the symmetry of the uh, property will be retained the dormer has a dual pitch roof and will be located centrally and because the property is detached will once again preserve symmetry. Whilst the next four blocks of semi-detached properties along Western Lane are hipped, these are all of the same design whilst the applicant's property is of a completely different design. You can just see the blocks of houses I'm referring to there. It's therefore considered that the proposal will not Tract from the character of the area, appear intrusive or dominate the existing property 
and the visual amenity is therefore considered acceptable. It is worth noting that if the hip to gable element was carried out on the original house, on the original roof part, there is an extension there, um, without the other work, without raising the roof height, without the front dormer, uh, it could some of that work be carried out under permitted development. In terms of the impact on residential amenity, the Council Sustainable Design and Construction SPD gives guidance in order to protect residential amenity of existing neighbours. Only the neighbouring properties, either side, numbers 141 and 147, you can see the numbers quite clearly there, hopefully, uh, and the properties to the rear, which is 1A, 1 and 2, the paddocks are likely to be impacted upon. The impact on number 141, this property here, this is the detached neighbour to the west and is on the same boundary as that of the proposed single storey extension to the side and rear. It has two windows in the side elevation facing 143, one at first floor and one at ground floor. The one at first floor serves the landing and so cannot be protected. The one at ground floor serves the kitchen and is an original, meaning it can be protected. And it will be affected by both the single storey extension and the dormer to the rear. However, a two storey rear extension was added to number 141 in 1979 and the ground floor extension is to the kitchen and contains a rear facing window overlooking the rear garden. This rear window is considered to be the primary window and the side window a secondary window and therefore the impact of the secondary window is considered acceptable as we can't protect that under the SBD. The single storey and rear extension which are shown as blue boxes on the slide project along the boundary beyond the rear elevation of number 141 by 4.3 metres. This is 300 millimetres over that recommended in the Council's SBD. However, that four metres is when the building is, uh, both buildings are semis and it's right next to the boundary of each. And in this case, it's mitigated by a separation distance between the house at 141 and the boundary. With regard to the rear garden, it's accepted that there will be some effect on the area near to the extension. However, the garden is 38 metres long and 7.2 metres wide, meaning only a small portion of it will be affected. In view of this, it's considered it would be unreasonable to refuse the application for the impact on this property. In terms of the new rear dormer, I've tried to show that on the plan as a purple dash line, uh, which is an approximate um, elevation of where, of where that will be positioned means the dormer will be 90 degrees directly down the applicant's, looking down the applicant's garden, similar to existing first floor windows. It must be noted that some form of dormer to the rear, just to the original roof structure again, could likely be carried out under permitted development. In terms of the impact on number 147, which is that one, which is the detached bungalow to the east and is an, on the opposite boundary to that of the proposed single storey extension to the side and rear. As a result of this, it's considered the extension will not affect any original rear facing windows to habitable rooms. In terms of the new rear dormer, as stated previously, any views from these windows will be 90 degrees directly down the applicant's garden, similar to existing first floor rear windows. The curtilage of this neighbouring property contains a residential annex which was created in 2014 as a result of an existing garage being converted. The annex is set 16 metres away from the original rear elevation of number 143 and does not directly face it. In any event, as the windows contained within the annex are part of an extension, they cannot be protected. It is therefore considered there is no detrimental impact on this neighbouring property. In terms of the impact on number 1A, the paddocks, which is this one, which is to the rear and at 90 degrees to the applicant's property and not immediately behind it. 
This property is set away from the western boundary by a minimum of five metres. It's that distance there. The northern elevation of this neighbouring bungalow is 22 metres away from the original rear elevation of number 143 and so approximately 22.3 metres to where the windows of the new dormer will sit. As a result of the relationship there will be no direct view over the rear garden or into any original windows to habitable rooms. It is therefore considered there's no detrimental impact on this property. In terms of the impact on numbers one and two, the paddocks, these two properties are directly to the rear of number 143. There's a separation distance between the existing single storey rear elevation of the applicant's property and the boundary to these properties of 37 metres and approximately 47 metres from the new rear dormer window to the boundary with these properties. And the new second floor window and the nearest rear of these properties uh, that's in line with it is at least 53 metres away. The council's SPD states there should be 30 metres between a habitable window of a second floor and windows of neighbouring properties. So the proposal exceeds this and it's considered there's no detriment, detrimental impact on either of these properties. In conclusion, it's considered that whilst there is no doubt there will be an impact to neighbouring properties, the proposal complies with the Council's design SPD and the recommendation is therefore of approval subject to a condition listing the approved plans. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jackie. I've got no speakers on this item, so we'll be moving straight into debate. So to enable debate, can I have a member to move the recommendations in the seconder, please? Councillor Wilson, Councillor Rutkin, the seconder. Thank you. Any member? No? Okay. So move to the recommendation to grant planning permission Subject to the conditions printed. All those in favour, please show. I think that's unanimous. Thank you. Moving on to item five, Jackie. Thank you, Chair. The proposal is to retain an already built dormer to the front and a canopy roof to the side. The original scheme was approved in March 2020 under the reference number 036967 and was for a dormer to the front and rear and a new first floor window to the side. The current application has been submitted due to an enforcement complaint as the dormer was not built in line with the previously approved plans. After visiting the site, council officers considered, considered that the amendments were acceptable in planning terms and an application was invited to formalise permission for the amendments. The amendments are the front dormer was built 200 millimetres higher and 350 millimetres wider than that previously approved and a canopy roof was added to continue the existing canopy roof across the front of the carport. This element was not shown on the original application. The application property is a semi-detached uh, dormer bungalow built in the 1960s. To the north, south, east and west are dwellings of varying type and design. This application has been reported to committee because six objections have been received from four properties. The comments are summarised on page 73 of the agenda. The key issues to assessing the determination of the application is the impact on visual amenity and the impact on residential amenity. In terms of impact to the visual amenity, the Council's SPD includes guidance for design. Both elements are visible from the road. The overall increase in the size of the dormer from that originally approved is compar comparatively small. The dormer is set below the ridge line and the property is set back from the footpath by 13 metres. The canopy roof is a continuation of the original. 
It is considered that it would be unreasonable to refuse the application on visual amenity grounds. In relation to the impact on residential amenity, this is again covered in the Council's SPD in order to protect the residential amenity of existing and proposed residential properties. As the dormer and canopy roof are to the front, only the neighbouring properties, either side, numbers 10 and 12, Sunningdale Close, are likely to be impacted upon. Neither element infringes either the 45 or 65, 60 degree line from the centre of the original front facing windows of habitable rooms of these neighbouring properties. And therefore, it's considered that there's no detrimental effect on the neighbouring properties' windows. It is therefore considered that the proposal is acceptable in terms of visual and residential amenity and the recommendation is of approval subject to a condition listing the approved plans. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jackie. There's no speakers on this item, so to enable debate, I have a member to move the recommendations and a seconder, please. Councillor Wilson and Councillor Lubkin seconded. Thank you. Any member? Councillor Wormsley. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, Looking at those the plans, I think I'd, I'd agree with the comments in respect of the dormer being built a little bit wider and a little bit higher. Um, the bit that actually concerns me is the continuation of the canopy um, across to the neighbouring property. It's not clear from the images, and perhaps you could confirm, does that canopy actually touch the neighbouring property to the left side, so the non-semi-detached? Um, or does it not? Because that would concern me if it did, um, because that would then potentially affect the change of whether or not arguments could be made as to whether the property remains detached or not. Um, so that would be a, a, a question concern from me. I don't know if there's anything um, officers can, can assure me on. You mean in that part there, don't you? And Yes, it is attached and you can see there's a lead flashing which is required um, to ensure that there's, it, there's no leak between, between the two of them. Um, it's not really a planning consideration in terms of it changing from a semi to a semi detached to a terrorist or whatever. And we haven't got any policy that is actually against that. Um, we've also received no uh, objections as far as I can tell in terms of that particular point. Thank you for that Jackie. Councillor Condacore. Thank you Chair. Uh, I was just wondering, we had six objections, were they actually the adjacent houses? I mean I don't know if we can say nowadays but uh, it, it seems rather strange we've got quite a few objections to this so I didn't know how the objectors were actually impacted. <laughs> Yeah, the planning legislation is, is that we don't particularly disclose where the, the information is from. It would be around the neighbouring properties, but um, I, I can't remember, I can't recall the addresses that we had anyway. Thank you. Any other member? I think from, me, from myself, as a comment from myself, I am a little concerned. It isn't what was originally the Urban Planning Commission for. I am wondering whether a site visit might be useful so we can see the impact for ourselves on the street scene. Well, I'm obviously expecting a second if we want to do that. Oh, Councillor Wormsley, thank you for that. Uh, members move to the vote on the site visit. All those in favour, please show. Ooh. That's seven against. One, two, three, four. That's carried. So we'll defer the item for the site visit then, Jackie, please. So it's the impact on the street scene. It's the impact on the street scene. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So that concludes the business for this evening. Thank you very much for your time and safe journey home.